Hello, everyone, and welcome. It's Al here with How to Draft MTG. Today, I'd like to share with you my early thoughts and draft strategy for Innistrad Crimson Vow, along with uh, sort of a rough pick order and a rough overview of each archetype in the set. As always, if you enjoy these videos, please do click like and subscribe. It helps the channel a whole lot. And if you have any questions or comments, please leave them in the comments below. I'd love to hear what you have to say. Let's get to it. So when you open up your first booster of Innistrad Crimson Vow, the first card you're going to be looking at is your rare or mythic rare. I'm not going to go over all the rares in the set in this video, as that would take quite a long time. But if you're interested, you can check out the Reddit post that I'm going to link in the description below, where I will list all the rares and mythics that I believe are first picks. Most of them are, and if it looks good, it probably is good. So go ahead and take your rare. Specifically, you're looking for monocolored rare creatures or rares that make good creatures. Uh, ideally, a maximum cost of six mana, although there are some seven mana rares and mythics that do look quite good as well. So if it looks good, it probably is good. Take the rare, move on from there. Next, you're going to be looking for flexible, efficient removal. This is going to be the premium removal of the set. It's going to be cheap. It's probably going to be monocolored, and it's going to be able to answer Lots of different shapes and sizes of creatures and permanents. These are going to be cards like Bleed Dry, Hero's Downfall, Parasitic Grasp, Abrade, Flame Blessed Bolt, and Rending Flame. Next, you're going to be looking for flexible, powerful uncommons. So monocolored uncommons that have a lot of power and hopefully aren't too expensive on mana. These are going to be cards like Twin Blade Geist, Cobbled Lancer, Diver Scob, Gutter Skulker, Storm Chaser Drake, Whispering Wizard, Fell Stinger, Voltaic Visionary, Bramble Worm, Infestation Expert, Oakshade Stalker, Reclusive Taxidermist, and Foreboding Statue, which actually might be one of the better pick one pack ones in the set as it is colorless and uh, helps you ramp and fix and turns into a pretty big creature later down the road. There are also some pretty nice build around and synergy cards in this set. These are cards that we're going to want to take pretty early in the draft so that we have enough time to actually build around them or later in the draft where we already have a bunch of support for them and they fit nicely into our deck. We would want to avoid taking these late in pack two if we don't yet have any support for them as it's probably going to be pretty hard in only one remaining pack to find enough cards that will work with these. This is a list of cards that look like they are worth building around to me or worth putting some effort in to make their synergies work. These are Panicked Bystander, Sigarda Summons, Bioloom Egg, Mischievous Cat Geist, Archghoul of Thraben, Catapult Fodder, Edgar's Awakening, Restless Bloodseeker, Wedding Security, Cloaked Cadet, Lambholt Raconteur, Paxong Pup, Wolfkin Outcast and Voldaren Estate. So after the first few picks of the draft, we're going to be trying to identify which color or color pair is most open, and we're going to be trying to draft towards the synergies within that color pair. So I want to go over each color pair and identify some of the commons which I think stand out and will perform well there, as well as go over the signpost uncommon which generally in limited gives us a good idea of what that color pair is trying to do. So first we have blue white disturb auras. The signpost uncommon is brine comer, which creates a good aura target, is a good aura target itself and becomes an aura later on. So it seems like this color pair is going to care a fair bit about auras. In terms of the core commons, we have Adamant Will and Cradle of Safety as combat tricks to protect our creatures that have auras on them. We've got Drog Skull Infantry as a premium 2-drop. It's a good rate on both sides. Griff Rider as the best training creature in white, but it, we have to make sure that we have a 3-power creature to help it out. We've got Heron of Hope, which is a great target for auras. We've got Kindly Ancestor, which is also a great target for auras. Both of these creatures can gain lifelink or have lifelink, and the Kindly Ancestor can be put on a flyer later as an aura that grants lifelink. Militia Rallier is a key training enabler as it's got three power and it comes down for only three mana. 
and actually attacks pretty well having three toughness. Parish Blade Trainee is an easily enabled creature that only needs to train once to be effective. And we've got Traveling Minister, which can help enable training as well. In blue, we've got Binding Geist, which will enable training quite well as it uh, has three power and shrinks opposing blockers. We've got Lantern Bearer, which is a great aura target and is a great aura itself once it dies. And we've got Wanderlight Spirit, which is a pretty good aura target as well. So this deck looks to be heavy white. We'll want a low curve to maximize our ability to pay disturb costs and cast other spells in the same turn. This deck will struggle a bit with removal as Sigarda's Imprisonment and Fear of Death are not very efficient or effective. Next, let's take a look at White Black Life Gain. Our signpost on common here is Markov Purifier, which is a life gain payoff, but it wants us to gain life without spending mana, ideally because its payoff involves spending two mana to draw a card. The same core of white commons are going to play pretty well here as well, as many of them provide incidental life gain. Traveling Minister and Heron of Hope are going to get slightly stronger in this archetype. Black is going to add Bleed Dry as a premium removal spell, Courier Bat as a great value creature and solid aura target as a 2-2 flyer. It's going to add Gift of Fangs and Grizzly Ritual as good removal at different points on the curve. And finally, it will also add Gluttonous Guest, which provides value, a good blocker, and incidental life gain. So Black adds some much needed removal, but this deck will again likely be pretty white based and less life gain focused as the life gain payoffs are few and mostly exist at Uncommon. White Red Aggro is next. This is another deck that will lean on White's core of commons. Red's going to add removal and another premium 2-drop, which is sorely needed, but there's not a ton of depth in Red here. The signpost Uncommon is Markov Waltzer, which gives us some decent stats and helps our creatures attack. can also help enable training by buffing something's power uh, so that you get a 3-power or 4-power creature on attacks. Red's also going to add a Braid as a premium removal spell, Blood Petal Celebrant as a premium 2-drop. This is a great attacker that provides value when it dies. Flame Blessed Bolt as another premium removal spell, and Sure Strike as a very good combat trick. So all three of these white decks that we've just discussed are kind of essentially the same white aggressive core supported in slightly different ways by blue, black, or red. Next is White Green Humans with the training sub-theme. Green adds a lot of ways to train, but we will lack in good removal. We'll no, we won't have to prioritize combat tricks, though, as there are a bunch of them in green and white. The signpost uncommon is Sigardian Paladin, which is a good rate creature that wants us to put 1-1 counters on our other creatures. And the way we're going to do that is by playing with creatures with training. So we'll use that same core of white aggressive commons that we discussed earlier, adding to that Apprentice Sharpshooter, which has great stats at 1-4 and will be really easy to train with its super low power. We have Dawnheart Disciple as a 2-drop. It potentially will be a reliable training enabler if we have enough humans that it can get to 3 power on most of the early turns. Flourishing Hunter is a good curve topper and will help us to win races. Hookhand Mariner is just a good rate creature with relevant types, being a human, and at four power will reliably enable our training creatures, although it is a little bit slow at doing that. Massive Might is probably the best combat trick in the set and enables training, making combat more favorable for us at only one mana, which is super flexible and easy to achieve. And finally, we have Spore Crawler, which is a three power training enabler that we don't mind trading off because uh, it gives us some nice value drawing us a card. So this will be another white aggressive deck, but we'll lean a little bit harder on the training synergies. Next, we have Blue Black Exploit slash Zombies. The signpost uncommon is Skull Scob, which essentially makes our exploits free. It doesn't exactly work that way, but it replaces the sacrifice creature with a 2-2 token. We can't use that 2-2 token for the next exploit, but uh, that's pretty nice value if we're exploiting a bunch to, uh, to not feel like we're actually losing any creatures on board as we do so. The core of commons that I'm seeing here that will work in this deck, Bleed Dry, obviously your premium removal spell, Doom Dissenter, and Persistent Specimen as pretty good exploit fodder. We've got Gift of Fangs and Grizzly Ritual as good removal on different points of the curve. 
We've got Lantern Bearer as a good rate creature that we don't mind exploiting. Rot Tide Gargantua is our main exploit payoff. Skywarp Scob is a good curve topper if we're reliably sacrificing our other creatures. And Stitched Assistant is another exploit payoff, although not quite as good as the Gargantua, I don't think. Um, so the better exploit payoffs are Bioloom Egg, Diver Scob, and Fell Stinger, which are all at Uncommon, so we may want to have access to those before we're really committing to this color pair in the draft. Next, we'll look at Blue-Red Spells. Pretty typical Blue-Red sort of strategy wants you to play non-creature spells, and we'll pay you off for that. Our signpost Uncommon is Wandering Mind, which is just a good rate flying creature that's most of the time going to draw us a card if we have enough spells in our deck. And it's not too hard to achieve that. I think you need somewhere between four to six to be hitting them somewhat reliably. And even if it's only like 50-50 to hit, that's still pretty good for the mana that you're spending. Um, so the core of commons I'm seeing here, a braid as a premium removal spell and a spell. Blood Petal Celebrant, again, as a premium two-drop creature. It's, uh, I think you are going to want to be attacking and pressuring your opponent in this deck, not being, you know, sitting back and being control. Uh, Cruel Witness as an actual spell's payoff, kind of. I mean, it's a four mana, three, three flyer, which is just a good rate creature. And then giving you that, that surveil every time you do cast a spell is, is a nice little bonus there. Uh, we got Flame Blessed Bolt, premium removal. That's a cheap spell. Kessig Flame Breather, which should be your main spell's payoff at common. It does get better in multiples. It's not super, super good. But uh, if this deck is going to be good, I imagine you do want multiple of these. Lantern Bearer, again, good rate creature, and it provides a non-creature spell on its disturbed side once it dies. And then you've got Syncopate and Siphon Essence, which play well with the red removal spells since you can sit back on your opponent's turn, hold your braid if you don't need to use it, and they try to cast a creature spell you want to counter, then you've got your counter spell up. If they don't cast a spell and they attack you and you need to remove, then you can do that. And of course, they are both spells, so they will trigger your spell's payoffs. This is another archetype that is more uncommon dependent, it would appear, as uh, Frenzied Devils, Lamholt Raconteur, and Whispering Wizard are all at uncommon. So maybe not the most consistent deck to come together, but it looks like it could be pretty good. Next, we've got Blue-Green Self Mill. This is the deck that wants you to fill your graveyard and hopefully will pay you off for doing that. The signpost uncommon is Vile Spawn Spider, which is an efficient blocker that provides incidental mill, which we always like to see, and a decent endgame effect. Unfortunately, it's sorcery speed, so your opponent will have a turn to figure out if they can survive your... 10 spiders or whatever you have, but uh, it's still pretty powerful. In terms of commons, we've got Binding Geist and Lantern Bearer as good creatures that we don't mind milling over since they have uh, disturb abilities. We've got Flourishing Hunter, which is a good curve topper again. Helps us stabilize if we're at a low life total. Hopefully you can get us back up there. Hookhand Mariner is just a good rate creature. Mulch as a card that will help us hit our land drops, which is very important in a deck like this, and also fuels our graveyard. Uh, maybe we hit a creature or two with it as well. Moldgraph Millipede it should be our mill payoff. It helps fuel the graveyard as well, which is pretty nice to see. Um, you want this to be like a 5-5 five, five or bigger to be happy with it. Uh, but if this deck is good, then I would imagine the Millipede is going to be a part of that. We've also got Sky Warp Scab, which looks pretty good here as uh, we should have creatures in our graveyard, so it will reliably draw a card for us. We got Spore Crawler again. It's a good rate creature. We kind of want it to die anyways because it's going to draw us a card, and then uh, it's in our graveyard powering up our Graveyard Matters stuff. And finally, Weaver of Blossoms as just a good ramp creature. We want to make sure that we're, uh, we're able to cast our spells as the blue-green deck does tend to have higher mana costs in it. All that being said, this archetype does not look all that powerful or super well supported at common. Cobbled Lancer, Crawling Infestation, Gutter Skulker, and Soul Cipher Board are all cards at uncommon that seem like they would fit into this deck pretty well. So we may want to make sure that this color combination is super open at the table, or maybe we've picked up a few of these build around type cards already before we start drafting the color pair. Next up is Black Red Vampires with the Blood Token theme. Our signpost on common is Blood Tithe Harvester, which is a good rate aggressive creature, 2 mana, 3, 2. It makes a blood token and itself is a blood token payoff. 
So this deck looks like it wants to attack and wants to make a ton of blood tokens. At common, we've got a braid, again, premium removal spell, probably the best common in the set. Belligerent Guest, as an aggressive creature that creates blood tokens. Bleed Dry, another premium rem removal spell, could be another one of the top commons. Blood Crazed Socialite, as a blood token creator and an excellent payoff for when you have a bunch of blood tokens sitting around. We've got Blood Fountain, which creates a blood token and gives you a little bit more late game action, returning some creatures later on. Blood Petal Celebrant, again, premium 2-drop. It's got additional synergy in the deck as it does die into a blood token. Flame Blessed Bolt as more premium removal. Gift of Fangs as good removal here. And the added flexibility of we're going to have a bunch of vampires, so it might help to uh, pump them up. Grizzly Ritual, another decent removal spell. With some synergy, making a blood token is nice. Ragged Recluse is our blood token payoff uh, here at Common, and is a solid 2-drop in its own right. We've got Rot Tide Gargantua here again. It exploits a 2-drop later in the game that's no longer useful. It's not at its absolute best here, but I think it does fit pretty well. We've got Sure Strike again as an aggressive combat trick. So this archetype looks really well supported at Common to me. It looks very aggressive, so I'm going to be looking to draft this one myself. I would recommend you do the same. All right, next we got BG Butts, black green butts. This is the deck that cares about creatures with high toughness. Uh, signpost on common is Ancient Lumber Knot, which is a good rate creature, 4 mana 4 4, uh, effectively, that wants other high toughness creatures. So we're going to be looking for those. At common, we've got Apprentice Sharpshooter. Again, this was a pretty good one, a good looking one in green white. Here it is again in black green. Easy to train, and it'll have very high toughness. Already has 4 toughness. Um, but could easily get to five or six. We've got Bleed Dry, again, premium removal. Flourishing Hunter as our curve topper. It's another really solid looking green common as we go through these. Gift of Fangs and Grizzly Ritual as solid black removal spells at different points on the curve. We've got Gluttonous Guest, again, as a value creature with high toughness, naturally. Hookhand Mariner is just a solid four drop if you need that. Sporeback Wolf. This is the first time we've seen this one. Is a high toughness two drop. Is a two four on your turn uh, that no one else is going to want because it's no good in any deck that doesn't have ancient lumber dot in it. Spore crawler, of course, another instance of this one. So this looks like a top green common to me. Good rate creature. Even if it's not super synergistic with the toughness stuff, it's still just a three mana three two that will trade off early and get you a card, or your opponent won't want, won't want to block it and you'll get in for damage. Uh, and finally, Weaver of Blossoms provides us with a little bit of ramp, and it does have higher toughness, which is nice too in this deck. So this deck doesn't have great options at two mana, which is one of the, the problems with it, uh, and it will depend pretty heavily on having Ancient Lumberknot and Catapult Fodder to really function effectively. For the record, I recommend not playing Unhallowed Phalanx in, this, in general in this deck, as it's too weak on its own. And finally... Red Green Werewolves. Is it going to be good this time? Spoiler, probably not. Uh, signpost Uncommon. Child of the Pack. It's a good rate creature. It does help you flip tonight because it provides a good mana sink in and of itself. And then, of course, its backside is absurdly good. Uh, at Common, we've got a Braid as a premium removal spell. Apprentice Sharpshooter as just a solid stat line that's easy to train as you're going to want to be attacking with this deck, I think. Blood Petal Celebrant, another premium 2-drop. A little bit less important as in this deck as it doesn't have relevant types, but I think it's still quite solid, and you're probably going to be picking it up early anyways as it's a, just a very good red common, in my opinion. Fearful Villager as a 3-drop werewolf, kind of medium, but it does fit in here. Flame Blessed Bolt, again, premium removal spell. Flourishing Hunter as your green curve topper that just crushes them and gains you a little bit of life. Hookhand Mariner, here it is in its natural habitat as a four-drop werewolf with good stats. Hungry Ridge Wolf making an appearance here. It's pretty easy to enable because you're ideally going to have other wolves and werewolves in your deck. And as a three-power two-drop, it's going to be pretty good at enabling training stuff. So if you have this and Apprentice Sharpshooter going, that's not going to be too bad. And Sure Strike, just a really good combat trick. Weaver of Blossoms, 
uh, another ramp creature, and it's got types that matter, and it flips into a werewolf. So this archetype in general doesn't look that great to me. It's proven very difficult for red-green to actually control day and night. It's easy to flip to night, because you just sit there and don't do anything, but uh, then that opens a window for your opponent to double spell you and you know set you right back to where you were, and then you know they've gotten quite far ahead of you in the process. So... I don't really love that, and the werewolves are not particularly impressive on their front sides to begin with for the most part. Uh, Wolf Strike should be decent in this deck, but we probably won't need it if we're picking up the red removal, and it's really only good when it's night, and I don't really see it fitting into any other decks, so uh, I'm actually not that high on Wolf Strike as the green removal spell for what it's worth. So those are my thoughts on the... 10 color pairs, different archetypes in the set. So we'll want to be navigating into a main color towards the end of pack one, maybe even a secondary color as well. I will remind everybody that the packs move in the opposite direction in pack two. So if white is looking very open in pack one, you're probably not going to see it in pack two and that's okay. You can expect to see it again in pack three. So stick to your guns on that one. Don't switch colors just because white all of a sudden isn't flowing like it was in pack one. I hope this video was helpful to everybody. Please let me know in the comments below if you have any questions or comments. Click like, click subscribe. It does help us a huge amount. And uh, enjoy your drafts. Good luck in your drafts. We'll see you very soon. Bye for now.